morning. Good morning. You can tell it's getting to be spring when you have to change your clocks. But you know, in uh, Southwest Florida, it's sometimes a little difficult to see the seasons. But I've noticed that the um, maple tree in my front yard, the leaves have all fallen off and they've got new, new leaves on there now. The avocado tree has blooms on it. The uh, mango tree in the backyard has already bloomed and has little fruit already on there. So this, this uh, communion meditation is about springtime. And uh, the title is the first of the feast of regeneration. <clears throat> now the Song of Songs, or the Song, Song of Solomon, verses 2, 11 through 13 reads, See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit, and blossoms, blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Over 800 years ago, in the middle of the 12th century, a great Russian a preacher, a surreal bishop of Tyrol, preached a beautiful and meaningful sermon on the resurrection. Spring had finally come to his cold land, but he could not think about spring without thinking of the resurrection. And he could not think about the resurrection without thinking of what he called the Feast of Regeneration. Listen to what uh, Surreal wrote. Last week there was a change of all things, for the earth was opened up by heaven. Today the heavens have been cleared from the dark clouds that surrounded us, them, as with a heavy veil, and they proclaim the glory of God with a clear <coughs> atmosphere. Today the sun rises and beams on high, rejoicing warms the earth, for there has risen for us from the grave the real Son, Christ, and He saves all who believe in Him. Today the winter of sin has stopped in repentance, and the ice of unbelief <coughs> is melted by wisdom. Today, spring appears, spruce, and enlevens all the earth's existence. The stormy winds blow gently and generate fruits, and the earth, giving nurture to the seed, brings forth green grass. For spring it is the beautiful faith in Christ which through baptism produces regeneration. Today there is a feast of regeneration for all people who are made new by the re resurrection of Christ. Listen to what surreal last statements. Today there is a feast of regeneration for all the people who are made new by the resurrection of Christ. Today, this every first day of the week, Resurrection Day, there is a Feast of Regeneration. This feast, these emblems of death, which exude the strength of life for all who are made new by the Resurrection of Christ, all of the people who are risen to walk in newness of life. Springtime has come. He is risen from the dead. Take and eat.
God. Some of you like to take your communion slowly, take time to actually commune with God. Uh, I think Paul is the table, and I know Claude does that. He likes to take time. So if you do, take your cup uh, and your, your cracker with you and your bread. Keep it and pass the tray on down. And if you look on the, on the seat in front of you, uh, there's a little small hook down there, and you can put your little empty cup up there when you're all done. This way you don't have to hurry in your, your uh, communion. Um, I'd like to read a little short scripture from the Bible written by a man named Isaiah in the year 700 B.C. And he was speaking to the people and the prophets and the other prophets that were there with him about a prophecy for the country of Israel, for the land of Israel. I'm only going to read a portion of it. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from those people who hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in a low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. We, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Like we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us with a, has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. That will make Amen. <laughs>
Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather here today to worship you. And we are good stewards of your blessings. And today we give part of that blessing back to you. The income that we have earned. We open up our hearts to you. And we thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. We ask you to bless us all. In Jesus' name.
They are like fire that purges to the bone. They understand you. You can weep with them, sing with them, laugh with them, and pray with them. Through it all and underneath it all, they see, know, and love you. A friend, what is a friend? Just one I respect with you. One who you dare to be yourself. Friendship, you mean the greatest love, the greatest usefulness, the most open communications, the noblest sufferings, the severest truths, the hardiest counsel, the greatest unions of minds in which brave men and women come together. Friendship. Jesse Owens seemed to be sure to win the long jump at the 1936 Olympic Games. The year before he had jumped, 26 feet, 8 and a quarter inches, a record that would stand for 25 years. As he walked to the long jump pit, however, Owen saw a tall, blue-eyed, blonde-haired German taking practice jumps of over 26 feet. Owens felt nervous. He was acutely aware of the Nazis' desire to prove area superiority, especially over the blacks. At this point, the tall German introduced himself as Luz Long. You should be able to qualify with your eyes closed, he said to Owens, referring to his two jumps. For the next few moments, the black son of a sharecropper and the white model of Nazi Germany stood face to face and chatted. Then Long made a suggestion. Since the qualifying distance was only 23 feet, five and a half inches, why don't you make a mark several inches behind the takeoff board and jump from there? then you're sure to be in the finals. Owens did that. He made the finals. He jumped and set an Olympic record and earned the second of four golds in those Olympics. The first person, in, the first person to congratulate him was Luz Long, in full view of Adolf Hitler. Owens never again saw Long, who was killed in World War II. Owens said this of him, you could melt down all of my medals and cups that I have won, and they wouldn't mean a thing compared to the 24 karat friendship I made that day. You want to say um, friendship is the first person who comes in when the whole world is running out. Jackie Robinson, the first black man to play in the Major League Baseball. Breaking baseball's color barrier, he faced jeering crowds in every stadium that he went to. While playing one day in his home stadium in Brooklyn, he committed an error. The fans began to ridicule him. He stood at second base, humiliated, while the fans jeered and got rowdier and rowdier. Then a shortstop named Pee Wee Reese came over and stood next to him. He put his arm around Jackie Robinson and pointed to the crowd. The fans grew silent. Robinson later said, that was a friendship I will never forget. That day, he saved my career. A friend is one who warns you in advance. Some people make enemies instead of friends because it's less trouble. Friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, What? You two? I thought I was the only one that did that. <laughs> Friends are like good health. You don't realize what a gift they are until you lose them. Prosperity begets friends. Adversity proves who they are. A small boy defines friends as someone who knows all about you and still likes you. Friendship is a single soul dwelling in two bodies. A lot to be said about friendship. And today we want to look at friendship. What does the Bible say about friendship? If you turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. <coughs>
Start with verse 9. John chapter 15, verse 9. Read like this. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. So what does it say about friends? What is a true friend? Someone who will lay down their life for you. Well, look around the room and answer this. Are there any friends amongst you? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that in our relationships we do that. I'm, I'm sure Randy would take the bullet for Dory. I'm sure. Absolutely. Hey. All he did was smirk. I was thinking, ooh, I picked the wrong man. How bad the bullet was, right? He, had, he, had a, he really had to contemplate and think about it. Not a foreign person. No. I mean, I mean, we're like that, aren't we? But the question is this. We are a congregation. We are a family. We are friends. You can lay down your life for me. Would I lay down my life for you? If you look at Scripture, if you look at the, if you look at the quote that was up here, a friend is someone who comes into your life and says, I'm here for you and proves it. If you look at Scripture, who's our friend? He says it here, I am your friend. I no longer call you servant, but I call you friend because you're equal with me. We're here. And to show you that you are my friend, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent Jesus to be your friend to die for you. But Jesus had a choice. Didn't he? Do you remember his choice? You could look at his entire life and see how he lived and what he said and what he taught and what he did. And when it came down to it, in the garden he said the words, Father, if there's any other way, Take this cup from me. But. But what? My will be done. Not my will, thine be done. He said, Father, if there's any other way, human side of Jesus saying, if there's any other way, but the godly side of Jesus, not my will, yours be done. And Jesus willingly took the beating. He willingly took the ridicule. He willingly took the cross for his friends. And he tells us in the scripture here, he calls who? Us. Friends. He said, I'm here for you, and then he went and proved that he was. That's a friend. Friend will lay down his life for another. And we, we see examples of it in, in society all the time, don't we? We see Columbine. The story that came out about the gunman holding the gun to the girl's head and saying, Do you believe in Jesus? She had a choice to make. 
I'll bet her human side was good. Don't. And yet her godly side won out and said, absolutely. As he shot her. And we can go through story after story in this world of people who stood up and said, absolutely. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a book you can go out and buy. It's about this thick. It's very small print. And it's page after page after page of people who said, yes, I believe. You can look at DC Talk's book, Jesus Freak. Page after page after page of stories of people who said, yes, Jesus is my friend. And paid the ultimate price for it. What I want you to look at in your lives is, is he that kind of friend to you? Now go back and look at what people said about friends. And what do you do with a friend? Yeah, what did you do last night with your friend? Went to the movies. Cindy, what do you do with your friends? <laughs> You get your nails done. You get your nails done with her sometimes. Yes. Send email, email. Send email, email. And they get their nails done together. She's a, she doesn't like saying that. But what do you do with a friend? Spend time with them. You invest in them, don't you? I mean, I remember. Gosh, third grade. Third grade, Nikki Stamos. I'll tell you the story. I went to the Museum of Science and Industry with my family, and I got a picture of the lunar rover. I took it with my little Polaroid Instamatic camera. Pulled that thing out, and you know it goes by heat, so if you stick it under your arm. It Goes faster and comes out. Got baby under my arm. I'm walking around the museum like that. <laughs> hold that out. If you hold it under your arm too long, <laughs> you get pure blackness. Yeah. Told my mom and dad, gotta go back to the moon road. So we were already there. My picture didn't turn out. I gotta have a picture. Why was the picture so important? Nikki Stamos. She wanted to see the moon road. And I wanted to see her. <laughs> so I thought, I'll get her a picture of the moon road. I remember my dad saying, no, 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 let's go, let's go. We, we, big museum, you got to see it all, let's go, let's go. And I remember, as they're at the bathroom, I'm thinking, it's just down the hall. And so I ran down the hall, snapped my picture, come running back. They're gone. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever been in the musical science industry in Chicago, but it's not a small building. You know, being in third grade, panic set in. And I remember my dad coming back for me. You ever been lost? You ever been kind of and that person comes back. Someone comes and rescues you. Say, that feeling you get. <sighs> I didn't care if he was going to smack me in the back of the head or <laughs> beat my butt or whatever it was he was going to do. I was just happy to see him. You know? Not only was I happy to see him, I had my picture in the moon room. And what I wouldn't do for this friend. Remember we get to school and I sat, my desk was right against the side wall where the second chalkboard was, and there was a rail, and I set that picture prominently on the rail where everybody could see it. <laughs> Nikki came in, and I'm thinking, <laughs> you can picture me, I had a shaved head, ear stuck out, <laughs> grin from here to here. I remember those words from her. Ah! Run 
Billy Wall went last week and got me a picture. <laughs> From ecstasy to crushed in a minute. Still had my picture. Didn't have Nikki. Fickle thing went with Ron because he was the first with the picture. She saw it. It's so funny because Ron sent me an inbox on Facebook two weeks ago. Ooh. I reminded him of the picture. <laughs> I said, How's Nikki? He said, I haven't spoke to her in 30 years. Ha. <laughs> yep, I know you haven't. <laughs> yeah. But it's just one of those things, you remember? Man, you'd do anything for a friend, wouldn't you? Camping out in the backyard, got us a little fire going, started spreading, we didn't know what to do. We're at Gene Matson's house, and in our absolute wisdom, we grabbed the screens out of the windows and started beating the fire. I don't know if you know what happens to screens when you beat a fire with them. And then they were, and I remember Gene saying, My dad will kill me. And I remember thinking, yes, he will. <laughs> you know how my dad is, Tracy. You know. So yeah, I know. I've seen him go out in the backyard and beat the dogs with a garden hose. Yeah, I've, I've seen your dad. He's like, he's going to kill me. Do you know what this friend did? We went home to my house and pulled out the screens. <laughs> <laughs> Put his burnt ones in their place. <laughs> took those good screens home to his house. <laughs> Middle of the night, I get thinking, wait a minute. You're not a very good friend. My dad is going to kill me. <laughs> I remember coming home with my dad saying, a couple days later, took a couple days notice, but what happened to the screens at the back of the house? Everybody's like, ooh. You know you are when you're a kid. Oh, well. Man, I, it finally came out. I got my spanking. Okay. But to Gene, I said, Did your dad say anything? No. You happy? <laughs> <laughs> Told him what I got for him. What we won't do for friends. What is it you would do for your friend? Do you remember uh, going out on your first date? <laughs> yep. <coughs> when you got done with your first date, you said yep, yeah, so we're going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do? Went home. <laughs> and? Did you tell any friends the next day? Did you? Were you excited? I don't know. You dated her since kindergarten, so probably not. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to have someone else. Her dad was a super. Uh -huh. Yeah, we need to do someone else. <laughs> Remember your first date? You don't? Let me tell you all about it. <laughs> you remember his first date? We need to get younger people, Tracy. We help her. He was young. I figured that was a good one. Anybody remember the first date? Come on. Someone help me. Right there in the back. Mark your trouble. Here it is. Uh -oh. What was your first day? Uh -huh. <laughs> Going to a baseball game with Mark. Going <laughs> to a baseball game with Mark. And when you got done with that baseball game at home, who did you tell? My mom. Your mom. Because your mom is your what? Friend. Friend. Did you tell her everything? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. He held your hand? Put his arm around you? <laughs> wow. Not on the first day, right? Not on the first day. But what I'm getting to is, with, with my best friend, I remember, he knew all about Nikki Sanders. He, he knew all about Bunny Lindsay. He knew all about Mara Gulliver. He knew all about the girls that, that I had interest in because I'd go around and say, man, did you see her? You know, there were four <coughs> elementary schools that went into it. One, high, uh, then it was called junior high, today it would be middle school, into one junior high. And when, when they did that, you came from different sections of town. All of a sudden, 
That was a whole new field to play. <laughs> now when you're walking along, going, Ooh, where did they come from? And, and he knew all about them. Because what? You share with your best friends, don't you? You share the good times, don't you? You share the bad times? Sometimes you take the beating that they deserve. Sometimes you go without so they can have. Look at your friends when you're growing up. Look what you did together. Look what you did together. And then ask yourself this. Is Jesus your friend? And if Jesus is your friend, did you share with them about that first date? Did you share with them about that first kiss? The sweaty palms when you reached over to hold her hand for the first time? Did you share about the bird screens in the backyard? Did you share with them all those things? Because that's what you do with a friend. See, sometimes I think that we think Jesus isn't our friend, but our genie. I think we think he's a ask him for and get it kind of person. But if you follow him in Scripture and you look at him, if you look at how John was with him, if you look at how Peter was with him, if you look at the relationship he had with Lazarus, you get the idea of what a friend is. And how they treat each other, how they took care of each other. And how from the cross he could call down to John and say, here is your mother. You see, Jesus, if he is our friend, he's the person that we share everything with. Cindy called it the BFF. Best friend forever. Is Jesus your BFF? Is he the person you share absolutely everything with? Is he the person that, that knows more about you than anybody else could ever dream of knowing? See, I know that he's those big words, omniscient and omnipowerful powerful and all those words. Which means he knows everything, does everything, sees everything. He's in everything. But he still wants you, his friend, to tell him about it. To share it with him. He wants you to stand on second base with your arm around him. And point at the crowd. He wants you to listen to his advice when he tells you to step back a couple inches from the floor. He wants to be that person you can count on in the good times and in the bad times. He wants to be that person that you can share everything with and know that it goes no further. And I had some good friends in life that I thought were really good friends. When you shared things with them, all of a sudden the entire school knew. What kind of friend was that? But Jesus is a type that you can share everything. And it goes no further. He's the type of person that wants the best for you no matter what circumstance you're in. He's the only kind of friend that can forgive you of your sins and they're gone. I remember my friends growing up saying they forgave me for certain things, and when trouble came along again, they were the first to remind me of the mistakes I made before. Jesus will never remind you. The Scripture says, when you ask for forgiveness, they're separated as far as the east is from the west. They're blotted out of the Lamb's book of life as if they never existed. Those sins aren't there, just your name. Your friend. That's what Jesus wants for you this week. He doesn't want just an hour Sunday morning. He doesn't want just a few minutes here or there. 
he wants your day. He wants all 24 hours of it. He wants to be your friend in and out of everything you do. Not only does he want to be the friend, he wants to guide you through it so that mistakes aren't made. He wants to protect you when harm's coming. He wants to warn you in advance when there's trouble. He's the type of person that wants to be there and do all those things for you if you would but claim. If you would but allow him to. But you have to ask him to be there with you. You have to invite him to go along through your day with you. So many times ministers, when we get together, we talk about it. We get so busy doing the work of the church that we forget about God. And then we get, hey, God, be in this. Be part of this. Help fill this. Help do this. You know, because if it's left on our own, what? We fail. But left up to Christ, it succeeds. So today I want you to look at your life. Do you have that kind of friendship with Jesus? See, He's proven to you already that He'll be that kind of friend if you allow Him. He's proven to you that He would take care of you if you let Him. He's proven to you that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And He says there's no other way to the Father but by Him. He is the only friend you'll ever have that can take you to eternity. And today He wants to be that kind of friend. He wants to be yours and yours alone. So if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ and you have no idea what to talk about this kind of friend, and get to know Him. Start looking into who He is and what He's all about. Or maybe you're here today and you've heard about Him and you've been here and you've learned it and you're ready to take that step of faith and step out and say, I turn it all over to Him. I trust Him, my friend, to run this better than I'm running it myself. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and He's been your friend. One you haven't talked to in 30 years. Maybe one you haven't talked to in a week or so. And He's asking you to talk to Him daily. Every minute. To turn over everything you are and everything you do to Him. To allow Him to be a part of everything you are because He is your best friend. To allow Him to guide your path and to steer your direction. If you're here today and you've claimed Him and He isn't that best friend like that, and what he's asked today is start. Start turning it over. Start giving to him so he can be yours completely. If you have a decision to make for Christ, whether it's the first time in your life or whether it's to get back on the path with him to make him your best friend that you claimed he was years ago, and as we sing our song, we have a decision to make any decisions. We have to stand and say,
take this, direct it. I, I'll make a mess of it. You'll do it right. I know that and I trust that because you're my friend. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the day. We thank you so much for the opportunity we have to honor you and adore you. We just pray that everything we did were pleasing to you today, Lord, that you'll be glorified because we were here. Now we ask you for strength and guidance as we depart, Father. Be our friends and guide us through this week. Help us to reach those that need you. We pray all this in your Son's name.